The Rick Unger Show. Welcome back to The Rick Unger Show. You know, with a little bit of distance now between the election, all the craziness that has followed the election, people are starting to finally hone in on kind of taking apart the election. You know, we all at this point believe that uh, we have a new president, uh, that Joe Biden is the president-elect of the United States. But now we have to look a little bit down ballot. And if you are a Democrat, you've kind of got to come to grips with the fact that the 2020 election was not a particularly good one when it came to other elected officials. Now, we do have an important race coming up uh, the first week of January where there will be an opportunity to elect two Democrats in Georgia if... If that were to take place, you would uh, put the Senate into a tie. And, of course, the vice president breaks all ties. So it's controlled back to the Democrats. But you got to wonder, in a year where more votes were cast than any of us can ever remember, why did the down ballot Democrats do so poorly? We're here to kind of walk us through this is our friend Bernard Whitman. Bernard is a Democratic strategist, a former Bill Clinton and Michael Bloomberg pollster, and the founder and CEO of Whitman Insight Strategies. Hey, Bernard, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me, Rick. How are you today? I'm doing well. I hope you are, too. I am. Thank you so much. Good. So... What happened here? I mean, at, at this point, we do need to come to grips with this and, and kind of figure out why did it go so badly for down-ballot Democrats? Well, you know, I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty, but I actually think I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I think the reason is quite clear to identify, much harder to solve. And that is, I really do believe the Democrats, the reason the Democrats really failed to knock off even a single, at this point, single Republican yeah. that come into the House and likely lost a dozen marginal district members in the House, and we did sort of very little uh, pickup in the Senate, is that our messaging, our down-ballot messaging, was largely a nationalized anti-Trump message, which was quite effective in bringing down the top guy, because Trump lost. You may not still realize it, but he lost. But it didn't do anything else. We, we really did not bring it down to the community level. We didn't bring it down to the local level. We didn't speak in local uh, language. Uh, and I believe that, honestly... The key to strengthening our majority in the House and finally winning back the Senate after so many years, potentially on January 5th, potentially by the thinnest of margins, is to speak very clearly, very plainly, and very directly in economic terms. We need to cast all of our messaging in economic terms, whether it be about the environment, healthcare, infrastructure, jobs, racial and social equality, student loan, immigrant, whatever it is. And we cannot simply run a nationalized, and we won't obviously have the uh, uh, ability, thankfully, or opportunity to run against Trump, but trying to nationalize local races just doesn't work. People don't live in the nation, they live in their community. Yeah. And, and you know, time after time after time, we see re-election rates for incumbents sky high. We need to break that. You know, it's fascinating. It gets a little bit confusing because it used to be that the saying went all politics was local. And then we hit a point where the saying changed and it was, well, all politics is national. You seem to be suggesting that, well, national elections may be national, but local politics remains local. Are you also saying that our candidates just didn't focus enough on issues well, I think we had some great candidates. I just think the framing of the issues and the framing of the language was wrong. We spent so much time on healthcare, and healthcare is incredibly important. But the healthcare message was about protecting pre existing conditions, which people certainly care about, and tying that to Trump, and tying that to the Supreme Court, and tying that to the Trump administration's you know, three and a half year effort to try to get rid of Obamacare. That's all well and good. But let's remember we're in the middle of a pandemic, yes. But that pandemic, which is a health issue, has has wreaked economic catastrophe. And even before the pandemic, when the economy was so quite, you know, so called rolling along, it was rolling along for those at the top and running into the ground for those in the middle and the bottom. And we need to understand that all politics, and I'm not sure whether Tip O'Neill, I always think about Tip O'Neill when, when the saying comes on, all politics local, but all politics is also local and economic. And if people are worried about their jobs, if people are worried about putting food on the table, if people are worried about, yes, buying their medication, but still buying prescription drugs 
is a healthcare issue, but first and foremost, it's an economic security issue. If people are worried about racial and social inequality, that is largely driven by economic disparity. And we have to reframe the language in terms of basic economic principles that can be discussed by everyone around the kitchen table, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're Latino, whether you're Asian, whether you happen to be a progressive, whether you happen to be a conservative, whether you happen to be a liberal, whether you happen to be in the suburbs or the urban areas or the rural areas, we need to get back to understanding and speaking language that that everyday Americans can understand and framing that in economic terms that really people can see a difference in their pocketbook. Hmm, interesting. Uh, if you are just joining this conversation, we're speaking with our friend Bernard Whitman, Democratic strategist. Uh, Bernard, and, and what we're trying to figure out here is it went well, it appears, for the top of the ticket in the 2020 election. Not so much for people further down the ticket. Uh, we did not gain one Republican seat uh, in the House of Representatives, but we lost some Democratic seats, and we don't know quite yet how it's going to turn out in the Senate. Bernard, is it just possible that the 2020 election was an anomaly that you just couldn't overcome the Trump question? I mean, it was so big and so glaring that it was just hard to get people to focus on other issues. And if that is the case, it still doesn't explain why Democrats actually lost seats. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer to your question, I believe, is 100 percent yes. Was it an anomaly? Yes. I think it was a double anomaly because Trump is such an anomaly. And, of course, we had a global pandemic and an economic meltdown, which sort of, you know, is anomalous in and of itself. But I, I don't think it's as simple as as saying that, um, that, you know, well, you know, we couldn't really figure out this year. So let's move on to the next time. We we really need to understand here that that all politics is not national, and people actually don't want to nationalize their politics. People have different issues locally, but at the end of the day, particularly in an economically challenging time, even when the Dow is skyrocketing, people are saddled with student loan debt, people are saddled in debt and jobs, people see CEO pay going up and up and up and basic income for those going down and down and down, affordability of homes is becoming increasingly out of reach. People think that for the really the first time ever, that the, the younger generation is gonna have it worse than the older generation. We need to reframe this. And if we look at what's happened under Trump, it's not just Trump, it's the Republicans. And yes, we can nationalize it on Mitch McConnell and, and there is there is a veracity in that. But the truth is the Democrats are a party of action. We wanna get stuff done. And what I would say to my friends and colleagues that are working so hard in Georgia, let's focus this race on getting stuff done for the people of Georgia. Resist the temptation to bring this national, resist the temptation to talk about Mitch McConnell. This is about making sure that the people of Georgia have an economic future that is better than the present and certainly better than the past. And speaking in terms and language and programs that people can understand about student loan forgiveness and about infrastructure investment. What is infrastructure investment? Yes, it's rebuilding roads and bridges and highways and all that, but it's it's actually putting jobs in people's communities. What about this whole Green New Deal? You know, the Green New Deal is terrible languaging. Finally, I think Biden made a big difference here because he started talking about the environment as a net job creator. When does innovation become a net job loss? Innovation in the environment can be a net job creator, millions of good paying jobs. We need to speak in that language and be able to show that Democrats working together can actually break this long jam and deliver actual value to the people of Georgia. All right, well, let's look at that, the Georgia race. Yesterday, last night, we had, I'll call it a debate and a half because uh, Senator Perdue refused to show up and to and debate his opponent. Uh, the other debate did happen. Do you see these two Democratic candidates doing what you're suggesting? I think they're starting to. I think they're starting to. I mean, David Perdue is doing exactly what I would hope David Perdue would do, which is to ignore and disappear and not be around. Because that visual, as absurd as it was, really shows that the one person in this two-person race that's actually showing up to work for the people of Georgia is John Ossoff. It's not David Perdue. And I think, you know, there's so much, uh, I mean, we're going to spend a half billion dollars in, in this Georgia runoff. It's an ins absurd amount of money. 
But I think that we need to sort of take the gas off a little bit of just talking about health care, which really dominated, I think, the airways yeah. and the messaging down there during the during the presidential and during the uh, during the, the initial set of uh, elections for the Senate before the runoff, and and really frame it in economic terms. And I think that we can talk about a lot of different issues that Democrats want to fight for for the Georgian people in terms of infrastructure and the environment and racial and social equality and immigration and student loan debt. But we need to all bring it back to economics, to putting money in people's pockets and getting this economy back to work for the average person. Strikes me as uh, pretty good advice, uh, advice you'd hope they would take. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting. We, we don't have a lot of time to dig into this, but I'm very curious what is likely to happen in two years when we have congressional elections again. Obviously, it's typically it works to the disadvantage of, of the uh, party that's in the White House. You think we can regain some of those seats and, and you got 15 seconds to answer? I mean, the answer is a cautious yes. Typically, as you know, the incumbent party loses seats. I'm hopeful that with an economic recovery, with the virus behind us, with Biden administration in control and Kamala Harris taking a prominent role in that effort, mm -hmm. we can actually show we flipped the, the switch here on the economy. We got people back to work. Let's spend another two years from 2023 to 2025 actually delivering more right. for the American people. Got to end it there, Bernard. I'm just out of time. Uh, interesting conversation. Bernard Whitman, Democratic strategist, former Bill Clinton and Michael Bloomberg pollster, and the founder and CEO of Whitman Insight Strategies. As always, Bernard, we appreciate the insight. Thank you so much, Rick. I appreciate you having me. You